Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What you're about to see is a documentary film by a child from Asturias who became an American citizen, Cole Kiblin, that's me. I'm Corsino. Well, that's not completely accurate, but for most of my life, I thought it was. Then I found out that I'm really Manuel Corsino. But that's not completely accurate either. Legally, I'm now cool killing. So when in Spain or with my Spanish friends, I'm Corsino. To my family and American friends, I'm cool. I was born in Asturias, Spain. That's completely true. Most of my life, I thought I was born in Huelga, Asturias, but that wasn't so either. Of course, I always knew my name. The name of my hometown is an old story. The mountains, the valley, and the fast-flowing river, the railroad tracks, and the highway, both beyond the river. The two-story flat stone house my father had built as if it were an extension of the mountain itself. And the path of the mountain through the woods, the small waterfall, and finally the upper meadows where an older brother tended the sheep with me as his constant shadow. Last but not least, there was my secret abandoned coal mine in the wooded hillside. Ah yes, my secret mine. How cool the air coming out of it. of Asturias have always been etched in my memory and always will be. Unfortunately, not, such was not the case with my recollection of my family members. Three of my brothers, Jesus, Julian, and Constantino, fought against Franco. Constantino survived but was imprisoned for some time. Julian 
about 19 years old, was killed in Asturias during the fighting around the capital city of Yedo. Jesus, my eldest brother, was arrested after the fall of Asturias and was summarily executed on Christmas Eve, 1937. Of course, I was too young to know what was going on, but the Spanish Civil War, which was started in 1936, was ongoing, and General Francisco Franco, the professional army, was rapidly advancing into Asturias from the east. The Asturian miners, poorly armed, untrained, and unsupported by the Madrid government, did not have a fighting chance. Then one morning about dawn in the summer of 1937, my father led me by the hand across a swaying wooden bridge and up to the highway. There, a big truck with its motor running away. My father quickly scribbled something on a piece of paper and put it in my jacket pocket. Then he lifted me up onto the truck. He had written down my name and a name which people later assumed was the name of a Hamlet, so that I could be brought back. Unfortunately, in his hurry, he wrote down the name of our home instead of the name of a Hamlet. What was a simple mistake was destined to dictate the course of my life. I never saw him again, but in my heart, I cannot fault my father. Sending me away may well have saved my life, if not from the war, at least from sickness or starvation. However, at one stop, I heard a man's voice say, this is Moreta. Somehow I remembered that. When the truck finally stopped and people began jumping off, we were by the sea at Musel, the harbor for the seaport of Gijon. Late that afternoon, the coal hauling boat, now loaded with human cargo, probably 7,000 refugees, slowly ventured out to sea. Cole, Cole, are we are gonna have to get ready and leave. Are you dressed and everything? Yeah, I'm ready. You ready? Yeah. Okay then, well we'll go to Bose. Okay. Okay. Late that afternoon, the coal hauling boat, now loaded with human cargo, probably 7,000 refugees slowly ventured out to sea. After three days at sea, the boat docked at Bordeaux in southwestern France. All of us and our families were greatly affected by the Spanish Civil War. Although in a manner of speaking, I was sent into exile for the rest of my life. I was fortunate compared to most of the members of my family who stayed in Asturias.
I was put on a train for a refugee camp located on the outskirts of Paris. Although in the following five years, I was shifted from place to place, this was the only place which might be termed a concentration camp, for it had barbed wire all around it, preventing people from leaving. It seemed to have been hastily put up. It was crowded with men, women, and children. And what I remember most about it was that a good portion of the grounds was covered with big, broken chunks of concrete as if some building had been raised. It was then that I began to realize that I would not see my family anytime soon and began to feel very much alone. Fortunately, my stay there was very short and soon I was transferred to a colonial or colony in Paris itself at Rue de la Pente. Don't ask me how I remember that name. This new place was what I think of as a quadrangle with a concrete courtyard completely enclosed by buildings on all four sides. Although there were children and some adults, refugees there, mostly women, I, I slept in a big dormitory with only young boys. Well, Cole Kivlin is the father we knew growing up. Corsino Fernandez is the father we found out when we got older. Not until 1996. Not until 1996, so. Yeah, that's the first we heard of Corsino. Two entirely different people. <laughs> well, they're both my dad. I've always known him as Cole Kivlin. Uh, but uh, I was, like I said, I didn't know about Corsino until I was like 21. My wife was the one that told me about him, um, but. Cursino, that's my father. That's just his Spanish name. <laughs> we knew, well, we knew growing up that there was something different and the way he, he had an accent. Yeah, an accent, the way he talked. Uh, but he was very quiet, so we weren't told anything. Well, they never talked about it. Um, I guess he was adopted, and the name Kivlin, our last name, is Irish. And I was always told he was Irish because people would ask uh, about his accent. And uh, I never noticed an accent with him growing up. That he was from another country, that he was from Spain, I did not know anything more than that. We had, I had suspected something all along because we'd find papers about him. Yeah, because I was 10 years old and I was home by myself and I was snooping around the house 
and I found his birth certificate. And uh, I thought it was pretty neat, and I thought I was going to get in trouble for finding out. <laughs> but they, they always kept it kind of quiet when we were growing up. So we didn't know uh, about his, anything about his history until he went over there. Well, I, like I said, I didn't for a long time. I still don't know all of it. Um, it was mainly my wife that was the one that told me about it. Well, he was told, from what I remember, that he was told that all his uh, family got killed in Spain. There was nobody over there. He had tried before when he was a lot younger, but the Catholic Church and everything wouldn't release any information to him so that he could actually find out about his family. Uh, I know that the priests and everything that he was involved with uh, was telling him he had a very bad past, let it go. Nobody's over there for you, your family's gone. So he never did, and then my mother got interested in genealogy several years back, and she talked my father into looking into his past. And that's when he started looking and he decided to go over there. How is he? Uh, better, better since he found his family in Spain. I think he's happier, I think, since you know he went back in 1996, we've seen a change in him because when he came back from Spain, when he stepped off that airplane, it looked like he was 10 years younger, and he was an entirely different person. He was more, more extrovert. He talked more. He was more happy. Uh, it's like he left all his problems back there, or he discovered himself. Well, I think he got some closure. I think he's happier now that he has gone back and found his family over there because I think that bothered him for many years. about seven years old. Seven? And yeah. how did you know your age? Well, actually my exact birthday is supposed to be in December. <laughs> but I was celebrating April. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But why April? Well, they had to make up a date, you know. Uh, to go to school in France, they had to have a, a birth date. So somebody made up the date April, April 5th, okay. you know. Yeah. So that's what that's the day I use right now. But uh, in 1996, when I went back to Spain and got my birth certificate, I was really born in December the, the 6th. You know. <laughs> oh, really, December 6th? Yeah. Think no, about, no. do you think about on December the 6th, though, that's your real birthday? Well, not very many people know that. Why well, no. not? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> And I didn't know that till, till 1996 when I yeah. when I got my, uh, my birth certificate in Spain. See. So as a child, you didn't know your birthday? What? As a child, you did not no, know your birthday? No, no, no. Do you remember anything about the orphanage in France? Oh, yeah, I remember quite a bit. I, was, I stayed there a while. <laughs> I traveled all over France. And eventually wound up in uh, Lyon, which is in uh, kind of... South, uh, in the south of France, southeast France, in, uh, Lyon, and uh, in a little town called Ecoli, and I stayed there most of the time. Okay. So cool, uh, Palou Fran... Palou Francais? <laughs> yeah, you speak French. <laughs> Do you speak French? Un peu. A little bit. A little bit? Un poco. 
Pokey? Un poco. Un poco. Un poco. Un poco. That's more than me. <laughs> I went to about, you know, four or five places in France because it kept moving around, you know, because of... Um, what? Okay, your book. Yeah. You were talking about when y'all were there that y'all didn't get a lot to eat or... Well, yeah. Uh, well, because you're doing, you know, France was fighting Germany. It was in, in a war. Most of the time was there, you know. And, uh, and, uh... We didn't have a, you know, we didn't have a lot to eat, you know, in the, in the colony. They, they, they scraped out some food, but we ate a lot of turnips, you know, and I hated turnips. <laughs> so this food's better? <laughs> well, a little bit better, you know. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but they had, for some reason, they had a lot of turnips, and I hated turnips, you know. <laughs> no meat? Not very much meat. Uh, we ate, uh, uh, what they call escargot, which smells, Snails. smells, you know, the, 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 the on rice, good. Yeah. What's it taste like? Huh? It tastes like chicken, what they say? Well, I don't know. Do you cook them? Well, no, we ate them raw. <laughs> <laughs> we took the shells and our toothpick and ate them raw. <laughs> no, they cooked them. But the smells are not bad when they're cooked. Well, they don't eat them over here, but they do over there. No, thank you. Grandpa, they want me to ask you, if uh, when you're in France at the orphanage, were you popular? Do you have a lot of friends? <laughs> well, I don't know if I was popular or not, but I got along with them. I didn't get in too many fights, but no. just a couple, you know. <laughs> Did you realize why you were there? I mean, did you realize what was going on? Why you were in that situation? Why I was? Yeah, did you know? I mean, did you Oh, have yeah. Any idea? I, I knew there was a civil war in Spain going on because everybody was talking about it, you know. Uh, but you didn't know when your dad put you on the back of that truck, right? You didn't know then what was going on. No, I didn't. Well, I, uh, I didn't know exactly what was going on. Yeah. But I knew there, there was something going on because... You never told anybody that you knew the name of a town that was near your home or they never asked you? Or Nobody asked you. So you just didn't yeah. share that information? Yeah, but you thought the name of the house was the name of the town. Yeah, and but it wasn't, they know. Uh, but, but the main thing I knew was the town of Moreta. And I, I could find it on a map, and I knew that my hometown was close by, you know, because it just took a little while for the truck to get, yeah. uh, you know, to get there. Oh, yeah. But, uh, uh, oh, man, look at that. Uh, uh, Dallas is winning. Yeah. Dallas is winning. Dallas is winning. Well, Dallas is winning. it must have been the winter of 41. They start sending some, some of the children back to Spain. And uh, those I had family in Spain, and I could not find my family, so I stayed there. And in summer '42, it went, they took me to Marseilles, and uh, and that's where we went. Uh, I stayed there a while, and then we took a boat. We took a boat to uh, North Africa, Iran. In uh, North Africa, and then we went by bo uh, my train to Casablanca. I feel, I feel kind of stupid answering those questions. <laughs> mm. After a two-day trip, we disembarked in Oran. A slow, hot, and miserable train ride took us to Casablanca, Morocco. The worst part was the heat and the thirst, which produced a dry, bad taste in my mouth. I don't recall any water being available on the train, and at every stop there was a rush for water. We stayed in Casablanca one or two days at the most before boarding the Portuguese ship Niassa on July the 12th. We were given plastic-covered identification cards with a string attached so that we could 
wear them around our necks. For me, it was the first concrete information about our destination. Although at the time I had no knowledge of the precise number of refugee children on the Nyasa, research much later in life revealed the names of 17 Spanish refugees as well as a sizable number of Jewish refugees from other European countries. Soon we were on our way again. On July 30, 1942, the ship sailed up an estuary and the boat docked at Baltimore, Maryland. A Portuguese cook gave me a parting souvenir, three new American dollar bills. To me, it was a fortune. Once in America, we were taken to what appeared to be a summer camp whose location I never knew. There we were introduced to the English language. After a week or so, we were taken to the Edwin Guru Foundation in the Bronx, New York. The Ed Edwin Guru Foundation facility was actually a temporary holding area until foster homes or in some cases orphanages could be found for us. As places were found, children were being dispersed throughout the U.S. In the summer of 1943, I and a boy from Bilbao, Jose Fernandez, were sent to a foster home in San Antonio, Texas. One of the first things that I noticed about Texas was the heat. Our stay at the McCool home lasted less than two months. The lady's husband was in the army in Europe, and as soon as he heard about us, he objected. Near the end of July, I was dispatched to a two-week Boy Scout camp near Ingram to allow time for other arrangements to be made. The whereabouts of Jose are still a mystery to me, The next destination was with Mildred Kivlin, whose husband K.J. Kearney Joseph was in the army in Europe. Mildred lived on Sunset Road on the north side of San Antonio. We never really did any kids. Well, they were in a nursing home. Well, but I mean, even we didn't know any of the Kivlins. The only thing I remember growing up is that you used to say something about K.J. Kivlin having something at the, the brewery there in San Antonio. One of the reasons that I was placed with the Kivlins was that they were a Catholic family. Unfortunately, events beyond my control doomed the master plan. In 1945, KJ came home from the army and there were immediate problems. Life with the Killings lasted about a year and a half. I'm convinced that Mildred intended to adopt me, for she enrolled me in, a, in school as Cole Killing. Yeah, Mildred lives in Austin. Uh, well, I like Mildred. But that's because she lived in Austin and we lived in Missouri. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, she was all right. Yeah, she was all right. Yeah. We got along mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. The removal from the Cavalin home caught me completely by surprise, since neither Mildred or KJ had hinted about it. The truth is that I was probably in a state of shock. Maybe it was that I had been moved around so much for years that my mind accepted it as just another move. 
To my surprise, Millard gave some absurd reasons, such as my reluctance to speak English and my wish not to forget, my lack of adjustments, etc. Well, all these reasons look good on paper and may be partly true, but they are not the whole truth. Cole, you remember when we first met? Yeah, vaguely. Vaguely? <laughs> oh, boy. It's been a long time ago. Yes, it has. Uh, we first met in uh, Ardmore, Oklahoma. Yeah, I remember that because uh, you were visiting your aunt. Yeah. And uh, I was in Colorado, and uh, I took the bus to Ardmore, Oklahoma to meet you. Yeah, well, first we were pen pals for a while. Yeah, that's true. Because both our pictures were in the same paper. Yeah, I was in Boysville, and uh, they had a fifth anniversary of Boysville, and they took my picture in the newspaper, San Antonio Express. And you saw it, and you wrote me a letter. Yeah. And I answered your letter, and then uh, we eventually met. Yeah. Making 50 cents an hour because I was working at um, at Frederick's, the uh, made they made the refrigerators. Yeah. And uh, that's where they started. I'm 50 cents, and then they they raised the minimum wage to 75 cents. Oh boy. So, so uh, I asked your mother if uh, she thought me making 75 cents we could afford to get married. <laughs> and she, I guess, she said, yeah. And said, well, yeah, if you. If you if you uh, really watch your money, you can, you can probably uh, make it. You know. <laughs> you remember when we got married at St. Gerard's? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Um, I was so scared and shaking, it wasn't funny. Yeah, I, th I thought maybe you were going to back out. Well, actually, I thought you were going to back <laughs> out, <laughs> but well, we made it. Yeah, we, well, I, uh, uh, I thought maybe uh, that uh, I thought maybe you liked Ali better than you did me, but uh, it turned out uh, differently. So. Well, I do like Ali. I've always <laughs> liked him. <laughs> but he was my best, my best man. Yeah. At the wedding, you know? yeah. But once we got back to the house, everything was all right. Yeah. Oh, boy, I wouldn't want to go through a second wedding. Well, I hope not. <laughs> well, I was wedding. so scared. <laughs> you were and scared. then we, we went to uh, Uvalde, Texas. Yeah, we borrowed a car from uh, your J.L. gave your, us your his uncle, car. J.L. And and he had an old car. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we drove to Uvalde, and uh, I think we had car trouble because he was an old car. Yeah. We had to take it to a garage there because he, he could hardly run. What I remember about Uvalde is the cheese sandwiches. Oh. There was no <laughs> restaurants open. We were hungry and finally found a <laughs> drugstore that made cheese sandwiches. Yeah. And I still like them today. Yeah. So how much Indian blood do you have in one or two drops of blood? 
Uh, no. <laughs> you have more than one or two drops of blood? I probably am about half Indian. You're half Indian. Uh, I, I didn't know I was marrying an Indian uh, woman. Well, you were just <laughs> lucky, that's all. <laughs> Indian squawk. <laughs> no, the Indians believe that if they had a dream catcher, they'd have good luck. And I don't know if it does bring good luck or not. Five kids, nine grandchildren, and one, two, three. Born a half great grandchildren. Well, you keep better track of them than oh, I yeah, do. Oh, <laughs> yeah, boy, I do. <laughs> uh, so, but I think they all did all right. Yeah, they, 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 they did it pretty good. Yeah. But um, I think everything turned out all right. Too. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't think I'd want to go through all that again. <laughs> <laughs> was it that bad? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just so darn scared. <laughs> so. Well, it was a struggle because, because we were young. And uh, uh, we had to move around. I, I worked with uh, Philco Corporation. And, uh, they, uh, they transferred me to El Paso. And uh, uh, from there, I went to Huntsville, Alabama. And I kind of moved around. We moved around a lot. You know. Well, Huntsville, Alabama was the place I have no desire to go back to. You didn't like it? There was nothing to do, no bowling alleys, no, no swimming no. pools, nothing. Yeah, for some reason, uh, things went better when I got a job and moved up to San, uh, you know, to San Louis, work with McDonald Douglas. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, things went better then. And then we moved out to uh, St. Charles, Missouri. Yeah. And I liked it out there. You like St. Charles? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we came back, we came here to Fort Worth. Yeah, I got a job with uh, uh, General Dynamics. General Dynamics, yeah. And then we were we went back to St. Louis. Yeah. And yeah. lived in Moscow Mills for a while. <laughs> yeah. And then we moved to Troy. We moved around a lot. <laughs> I know we did, yeah. yeah. But I moved around you know, all my life. I've been moved around a lot. impossible to find a parking space. Yeah, it's getting so big that it's, it's, it's not a little town anymore. <laughs> it's just, no, it's not the cow it's, town that it's always no, been famous no, no. for. Uh, it's, okay. it's nice. I like to go to the different malls. How about going back to Asturias? <laughs> well, I know they always ask you that when we go over there. It's it's a it's a nice place, but uh, you know, but it's just, not home. It's not home like it's we're here. It, uh, it gets windy here, but yeah. it's still nice. Yeah, well, the wind's not bad. No, it's, it's no. pretty good. Breaking the leaves is. Well, gives me something to do. Yeah. 
though. But this is the best state to live in. Yeah. If you had a choice, what uh, town would you live in? Anywhere, any place in the world. Well, I think this is a good place, either here or San Antonio, but uh, 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 probably here because uh, San Antonio may be a little bit too hot in summertime. But uh, I, I think uh, Fort Worth is about as good as any place I lived in. Are you dressed, ready to go? Sure. Cars out in the front? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. well, we'll leave then. Okay. Let's go. Uh, why did you wait so long to tell me the history of your life? Well, I didn't know uh, how you were going to take it, you know, because uh, uh, you had American friends, and because uh, I was born in Spain, and uh, I didn't know how you would like uh, to have somebody that uh, was born in a, in a foreign country. Well, I know there were some uh, people that thought you had a, a horrible accent. Well, I did have an accent. Well, I, I never saw it. No. I never noticed it. Well, but uh, a lot of people, in fact, I still have an accent, you know. Uh, you do? Yeah. So oh, what was the job that you liked the most that you've had? Oh, I think uh, uh, my favorite job was uh, when I worked for McDonnell Douglas as a, as a technical writer. Uh, because I always liked to write and uh, uh, it was a desk job and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a hard job physically. It was more men, you know, but uh, I like to write and that, that, so that was my favorite job. Yeah. Why, why did you uh, encourage me to write the book? I wasn't particularly eager to write a book because I, I, didn't, I didn't think I was a very good writer, you know. <laughs> Well, I think you did a real good job on it, but... Uh. <laughs> well, uh, mainly I wrote it for, for, for my, our children. Uh, I, mean, I didn't write to try to make money out of it or anything like that. You know, I wrote it for the family to, uh, to know more about me, you know. After retiring from McDonnell Douglas, we moved to Fort Worth, where most of our children were living. I had to work a few more years until I could start drawing Social Security, but by 1995, I had to try what I had been wanting to do for many years, return to Asturias to find my family, hoping that what I had been told about their deaths was not true. For several months, I gathered all the information I could and saved enough money for the trip to Spain.
by late April 1996, I had obtained my passport and armed with the most detailed map of Asturias that I could find, I flew to Madrid on Delta Airlines. The drive from Madrid to Asturias in a little stick shift rented car seemed to take forever and was somewhat stressful because I was in unfamiliar territory. The key to starting my search was that almost 60 years earlier, while lying in the truck as it made its way up the valley, making periodic stops to pick up more passengers, I heard a voice say, this is Moretta. That simple statement stuck in my brain throughout my life and was a clue about where to start my search. Although I was in a hurry, I drove too slowly for most Spanish drivers who are very impatient. But after about six hours, I was in Asturias. I was immensely relieved when, in the afternoon, I finally saw the Moreta, five kilometers exit sign on the autopista. But Moreta was not my destination. It was only my starting point. I knew my home was somewhere further down the valley. I had to find a bridge that crossed over to the south side of the Ayer River. So I passed through Moreda and drove east for several kilometers. So I remember the, I remember the bridge all the time. So that's when, when I came, I was looking for the bridge. And, uh, uh, with the, so I, I could never see it when I came, you know, because it wasn't, I, I didn't know that had been uh, destroyed by, uh, by the flood, you know. Cole, if your mother was alive, do you think she would have let your father put you on the truck and, and uh, go to France or? I don't think so, no. no. I couldn't see the bridge, so I drove by to the gas station up there and asked, you know, well, don't it sound like work? When I saw a gasoline station, I decided it was a good time to fill up the gas tank and started asking questions. The guy had never heard of a town called Guelga. He thought it might be in the hills by Moreda. So I drove back to Moreda, parked the car by the plaza and started asking questions in my meager Spanish. and started driving and there was a man walking up there and I asked him, I asked him, we don't understand like we're going, no savvy. Although well, people tried to be helpful, they had never heard of Guelga. But I was finally introduced to Julieta, a 29-year-old young lady who taught English to private students. Cuantos, por la mañana, cuando estaba esperando a la, a la, a la joven mujer para venir, uh, el dueño del hotel uh, había en un papel, el teléfono, él llamó el teléfono, el teléfono. y en 15 minutos, dos mujeres uh, llenan el, el, el hotel. Ah, dicen, eres, eres cocino. 
So see, of course, you know. It took me a while to find out how they have found me. But this is a story. The previous afternoon, one of the people that I had talked to was an old woman. She had a daughter who was a hairdresser. Early the next morning, the hairdresser was telling her first customer about a stranger in town looking for his family. The customer exclaimed, I know who he is. The customer was Maruja, Maria Luth, one of my cousins. Actually, get going. Look. Yeah. Because I didn't know what, what I f would find. I, I didn't really think I'd find anybody over there, but I was lucky. Uh, extremely lucky. I told you you'd find somebody. Well, you know, after I, I found, uh, uh, you know, I stayed in, in a hotel in Moreta, and uh, uh, andando para el hotel de mi pichero en mi hermano vivía en, en también donde mi hermano vivía en Moreta, mi, mi hermano Constantino, andando para el apartamento de Constantino, él le amó y toda después, la familia en, uh, y uh, le pregunté dónde estaba uh, la huelga, y dice, no es la huelga, es Castandielo, <laughs> es Castandielo. <laughs> Once I met my brother Constantino, he told me about the bridge having been washed away, the real name and the location of the town, and the family history. He also called all the living relatives, and in the next couple of days, we had allowed visitors at his apartment. You think bad of your father that he put you on a truck and you left? I know you thought it was a short vacation, but what did you think about your father doing it? Well, uh, I'm sure that uh, he thought that uh, by putting me in a truck to leave, that he was uh, say, probably maybe saving my life, you know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he probably he probably thought that he was doing me a favor by uh, by uh, putting me on the truck, but he didn't know that I was be gone forever. You know. Oh uh, no, I don't think he'd have put you on the truck if he'd have known that. Unfortunately, most of my immediate Spanish family members had died. But out of my 11 brothers and sisters, four were still living. I carried them in an old folks home in Naranco, near Oviedo, Fermin in Gijón, Aurora in Cordoba, and Constantino in Moreda. Now, what did, uh, didn't Constantino not believe at first who you were until you started talking about that cave? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, uh, we both remember that uh, cave close to where, where uh, our house was. Yeah. And, uh, and that's not, when he believed you. Yeah. Actually, it wasn't a cave, it was a, an old abandoned mine. Coal oh. mine. Lots of cold air coming out. Of yeah, it. but uh, you know you could hardly see it. Yeah. But uh, so it had to be somebody familiar with it to yeah. know that, you, that the mine was there.
following year, my wife, Barb, was well enough to return to Asturias with me. We also expanded our trip to include a trip to Córdoba to see Aurora and her husband, Paco. Since then, we have made several more trips to Asturias, and one of our daughters, Bo, and her son went with us on one occasion. Unfortunately, my Spanish family had gradually become smaller. Both Constantino and Furman passed away within a week of each other in January of 2000. Arcadio too passed away in 2004. Now out of the original 12 siblings, only Aurora and I are left. I am thankful that we were able to reunite after so many years. Believe me, it was a big relief to find my living relatives. From the time that I was sent to France as a seven-year-old, I think people had assumed that since my family could not be found, they were all dead, and that is what I was told. Sometimes, however, I wonder how much of an effort was made to track them down. The fact is that I was never told that anyone was trying. But I suppose that with hundreds of thousands of refugees, not much of an effort was made. Asturian? Oh, well, yes, I, I know I was born in Asturias, yes. Uh, and I like to visit Asturias once in a while, uh, where I was born, and my, to see uh, uh, where the house used to be. Uh, although now they, uh, they destroyed the house to make a, a new street, a new, new highway. Uh, it's a shame that they had to tear down the house, you know, it's a shame, but, you know. Can't do anything about it. <laughs> but uh, I think the river will always be here, and the railroad tracks will always be here, and the mountains will always be here. You know. Do I think <laughs> Corsino? <laughs> well, uh, a little bit, but uh, uh, right now I'm, I think like I'm more of an American. You know. Well, my heart is always here. <laughs> Uh, my body may be all, all, uh, another place, but my heart is here. <laughs> Corsino ahora is the cool children. <laughs> es un americano. <laughs> So Corsino is still living, right? Yes. <laughs> Very much. No separate say que soy Corsino, pero aquí también soy Cole Kiblin. And so, on paper, my story ends. For as long as there's life, there will be challenges. For without challenges, there's no real life. So hopefully, my story will continue in life.
Thank you.